and it's really an honor for me to actually be here on the same stage as two of my uh, most uh, favorite economists, uh, my heroes. And I also want to thank the creator of the poster for making me so much bigger than these two economists. <laughs> I uh, previously was thanking uh, Dr. Benson and Dr. Friedman, and, and Dr. Friedman said, you really shouldn't thank me first, because you don't know what I'm going to say. And then this morning when I saw him, he said, are you ready to be crucified today? <laughs> so thanks so much uh, in advance. I appreciate it. The topic I'm going to be talking about is how are markets possible? So we know that markets are beneficial for people when they cooperate, but we also know that there's potential for things going wrong. So if people fraud each other, defraud each other, or uh, act opportunistically, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So what I'm going to do is talk about the overall issue, and then I'm going to provide some case studies from history, and then I'm going to talk about the implications. So my professor, and uh, Ben Powell's professor, James Buchanan, who won the Nobel Prize, basically characterizes the world as a large-scale prisoner's dilemma. And in the prisoner's dilemma story, you have two prisoners arrested, and they could uh, not tell on each other and go free, but instead they each have an incentive to rat on their friend, and they both go to jail for more time. So his idea and many other people's idea is you need to force people to cooperate. You need to force people to uh, avoid the prisoner's dilemma situation. So you need external prohibitions that will enable a greater number of mutually beneficial trades to take place. So just to give a couple quotes, Israel Kirzner, the economist who visited Texas Tech just uh, this spring, our last spring, he says, without enforceability of contract, the market cannot operate. It follows that those institutions cannot be created by the market itself. Another uh, professor from NYU, Richard Epstein, says something similar. He says, law becomes critical to offer a secure framework for voluntary transactions to take place. I'll give you two quick more quotes. Douglas North, who won the Nobel Prize, he just passed away last year. He says, in a high technology world, a third course of third party is essential. And then I'll conclude with this last quote is Manker Olson says, in advanced markets like a capital market, you require impartial third party enforcement. Okay, so the, the issue is markets cannot solve the problem of fraud. Governments are able to solve the problem of fraud. Therefore, government enforcement is necessary. Thanks so much. <laughs> Did you want me to keep speaking? <laughs> not, not usually, but in this case, yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to actually go through some historical examples that I found in my own research uh, to find that a lot of the assumptions that people have about markets are actually not the case. And I'm going to go through and give you a few examples starting with the idea that government is not always there to help us out. They're not always there to enforce contracts in a low cost way. So this is a true story. I was buying these ties on eBay, and this was the actual option. You can see they're striped Brooks Brothers ties. And when they came, I got a Paisley tie from Oscar de la Renta. And it was the worst possible thing that could have ever happened to me to have this case in time. So I went into depression. And after I emerged from depression, I decided, what can I do? So I called the cops. I'm like, go get that guy. Go arrest him. Um, that didn't work. I called the FBI. Go get him didn't work. I tried everything. Actually, what I ended up doing was I tried to contact the guy, he didn't respond to my emails. And so who did I actually call? I didn't actually call the cops. Who did I call? eBay. eBay, okay. So eBay is a private club. It is a private, in this case, arbitrator that has a system 
for resolving disputes. So rather than me needing to go to the courts of law, I simply sent in a letter. They somehow investigated that the guy was not responding to my pleas for help. Um, and so they refunded my money that day, All right? So that was a trial that took place within hours. My uh, professor here, James Buchanan, is famous, among other things, for this theory, economic theory of clubs. And he says, rather than thinking about goods as purely private goods where only one person consumes it, or purely public goods where everybody consumes it, most goods, he said, are club goods. And so we can think about uh, a swimming pool as a club good that's shared by a thousand people. Or this hall right here is a club good that is shared by a hundred people. So we don't need to think about things in this such stark terms, either the uh, individuals do it or the government needs to do it. And so I'm gonna apply this type of thinking uh, that he has in addition to uh, his theory of clubs, his discussion of the economic costs and benefits of rules to clubs like eBay. And we can think about uh, eBay evaluating the costs and benefits of adopting additional rules. So this is just a simple uh, set of assumptions where we can imagine uh, rules have marginal costs, marginal benefits, and eBay has an incentive to choose the right number of rules. They don't want them to be too onerous. They also don't want it to be too uh, lackadaisical with no options. And so they're going to choose the optimal quantity of rules to maximize the value of their club because they're competing with other clubs like Amazon and uh, many other venues. All right, so let me go through and give you a few examples quickly to show that eBay is actually very representative of a much wider phenomenon. All of the world's most complicated markets for hundreds of years have been enforced privately in much the same way that eBay was. I'll start with talking about the Dutch stock market in 17th century Amsterdam was basically the first equities market in the world. This is a picture of one of the first bonds from the Dutch East India Company. And they had a lot of contracts in the 1600s that took place, but government viewed them as a form of gambling. They thought speculation was a bad thing, and so they said, we're not going to enforce the vast majority of contracts. <laughs> Nevertheless, people engage in very sophisticated trades forward contracts, short, short sales, uh, options, hypothecation, which is pledging equities as collateral for a loan. They had all types of advanced contracts. Uh, why did they do this? How could you trade in a contract which is not enforceable by law? And I'll give you uh, another example, which is London, and, and I'll answer that question. Here, too, London stockbrokers were viewed uh, without a lot of respect, they were expelled from the Royal Exchange, and so they ended up just continuing their business, but they had to meet in coffee houses. So here's a picture of Garraway's Coffee House, one of the places where they traded. Another one was Jonathan's Coffee House. And Adam Smith, the first famous economist, actually addressed this question. He talked about how certain contracts were unenforceable, but people did it anyway. He says buying stocks by time is prohibited by government. So basically, most contracts were called time bargains. He says the law gives no redress. He says, but in the same manner, all laws against gaming never hinder it. People buy stocks by time anyway. Yet, even though they're unenforceable, all the great sums that are lost are punctuated. <laughs> so it's unenforceable, but people did it anyway. And he goes on to say why. He says people who game, gamblers, must keep their credit, else nobody will deal with them. It's quite the same with stock jobbing. They who do not keep their credit will be turned out and in the language of Change Alley, be called a lame duck. So if you're trying to deal with somebody all day, multiple times, and you default on your contract, other people are going to not want to deal with you. He says, it's reducible to self-interest. A dealer is afraid of losing his character as it's scrupulous at observing every engagement. When a person makes 20 contracts in a day, he cannot gain so much by endeavoring to impose on his neighbors as the very appearance of a cheat would make him lose. 
Okay, so this is what modern eco economists call the discipline of continuous dealings. And that's how most business is. When you go to a restaurant and they say, oh, we're not going to serve you today, or we're going to give you bad service today, you're not going to want to go back. Um, and this phenomenon happened in London with the uh, stockbrokers trading in a coffee house, and they basically transformed what was a very informal environment into a private club. They changed the name of Jonathan's Coffee House to the stock subscription room, eventually the stock exchange, and they adopted as their motto, my word is my bond. They did this here in London, but if you look around the world, there's a lot of other markets that came out of coffee houses. So Lloyd's of London, the insurance and banking entity was Lloyd's Coffee House. The precursors to the Philadelphia Stock Exchange was in Merchant's Coffee House in uh, Philadelphia. In New York, the Tontine Tavern and Coffee House. They created a club to create and enforce rules. Also, Sotheby's and Christie's, Christie's used to have auctions in coffee houses. Let me move forward to some other examples. I mentioned Lloyd's of London. They had a whole very sophisticated insurance scheme in case your uh, basement got flooded, you could call them up and uh, the adjuster would come right away. But uh, there were a lot of very complicated things at sea and Lloyd's had a bunch of basically adjusters and they would, they would figure out what things were worth and it was all done <coughs> privately. In New York, here is a picture of the Tontine Tavern and Coffee House and Merchants Coffee House, the precursor to the New York Stock Exchange, where merchants got together and said, let's create rules about who can get it let in. If you default, you're not going to be a member anymore. In uh, the 1800s, they evolved a lot of very formal rules. So things like uh, modern disclosure requirements, where firms had to say what their profits were, what their assets were, were mandated privately by the New York Stock Exchange. By the time the Securities and Exchange Act was implemented uh, around uh, 100 years ago, roughly, these <coughs> rules were already in place from the uh, New York Stock Exchange. In more modern times, you have lots of private rule enforcing bodies. So imagine having a futures contract, which maybe is a year from now, and you have to make it and hope that your counterparty is going to pay a year from now. Who here would feel comfortable making a futures contract a year from now with this guy? <laughs> or that guy? Show up a year later and he's like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. There's a lot of downside risk in advanced financial markets. But actually, when you make a contract through a clearinghouse system in a futures exchange, you're actually not making a contract with that person. You and that person are making individual exchanges with the futures exchange. The clearinghouse is assuming all third-party counter default risk. So you've got a very advanced contract which is governed privately. They're preventing problems from uh, occurring. I'll mention a couple last uh, issues. Uh, here's a, uh, a, a Google uh, investment opportunity. I got an investment opportunity from a guy uh, over the internet, and he assures me that we're both going to make a lot of money. And I know if there's any problems, I can just call up the cops, and they'll go track down my money. Well, there's lots of things that go on online where people get defrauded, and there's nothing you can do about it. In the early 2000s, PayPal was getting defrauded to the tune of tens of millions of dollars uh, per month, and they called the cops. They just couldn't get their money back, and they were about to go bankrupt, so they realized, let's figure out a private solution for the preventing fraud. Here, they created an artificial intelligence-based system to assign scores to see whether a transaction is legitimate or as fraudulent, and they prevent fraud from occurring to begin with rather than dealing with it after the fact. Uh, so they freeze your account, they have all types of CAPTCHA, uh, authentication things. In addition, we have things like CyberSource, 
which is now owned by Visa. And these are another ways of creating a, a system to prevent problems from before they occur. So here's the way that they think about it. You can accept an order. You can turn down a good order. You can accept a bad order. There's all types of things that you could lose profits from. So they, they view this as an economic question. They, use, they view fraud management as a risk management problem rather than a legal problem. So you've got a system that is processing millions and billions of transactions, and it is fig figured out how to reduce the fraud rate to a very acceptable level. Here's the fraud loss ratios online. And you can see it's gone down from 3% uh, in the early 2000s to now 1% today. And certain groups like PayPal, their fraud loss ratio is half a percent. So it's really quite amazing. You couldn't take people, an, an anonymous fraudster to court because you don't know who that person is. But these companies have figured out how to deal with the problem before it occurs. Uh, let me give you another few examples quickly. In modern financial services, you've got very tremendously complex instruments, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps. Uh, there's a lot of complicated things that go into them. We could assume that politicians are the people who are making this possible. Barney Frank knows how to you know, make credit default swaps possible. But in reality, these guys, these politicians, are debating the most basic economic points that no economist would ever agree with. Their proposal for the Financial downturn is let's pr let's put price controls on uh, interchange fees for debit cards. It's like that's not going to prevent the next economic downturn. Instead, you have private groups like ISTA, International Swaps and Derivatives Association, where they're looking over these markets, they're setting the rules of the game, and helping credit default swaps pay out in cases when uh, issues occur. I'll mention a couple bricks and mortar examples in uh, San Francisco for the past 150 years. There's been a system of private security. They were fully deputized private police up until the, the 1990s. Who here has seen this movie? It is the single best movie you've ever seen about private police. It's also the single worst movie you've ever seen about private police. It's the only movie about private police in San Francisco with Mila Jovovich and Christian Slater. And he inherits a company that his brother owned. It's actually uh, not worth watching. But anyway, <laughs> these people still exist. And you can subscribe to them. And they will show up to your uh, issues a lot more quickly than the government police. So when I was in San Francisco, I remember I was in Safeway once. And there was this guy, maybe he was on drugs or something. And because uh, basically, in the middle of Safeway, just lying, standing, looking up at the ceiling. And Safeway people came up to him and they said, are you okay? He's like, yeah, what are you bothering me? There's nothing wrong. And he's just like sitting there. And if you call the cops for something like that, the cops will not respond. That is classified as a low priority event. If there's a felony in progress, you're lucky. They might come within 10 minutes. But something else, a low priority event, they will not send anybody at all. So instead, if you're a merchant, you can hire these private police. In addition, we have all types of private security as well. Let me uh, mention something. I know Bruce Benson is going to disagree with me on this last point. But the idea that in addition to private third parties enforcing rules, there's the idea that individuals can enforce rules on themselves. In MIT, they did a study where they asked people to think of the Ten Commandments, and then they asked them to uh, calculate something and then report honestly or dishonestly. And just asking people to think about the Ten Commandments made them more reliable. So here's the quote from Macaulay. He says, measure of man's real character is what he would do if he knew nobody would ever find out. So in business, there used to be things called character loans in banks. So your bank, if they know you're a reliable person, you're a moral person, they would lend that money to you. All right, let me uh, start to wrap up. I'd like everybody to realize private governance is everywhere. 
It underpins markets, and oftentimes we don't even know about it. It works behind the scenes for very small transactions when government calling government courts is not practical. It also works for very large transactions when uh, there's too much money at stake and we don't want to get bogged down in government courts. And there's many informal ways, informal forms of private governance. So simple things like dealing with friends, dealing with honest people, dealing with multiple people over and over again can make contracts self-enforcing. You can hire third parties like PayPal to assume and manage risk with a clearinghouse to assume and manage risk. You can also create bonding mechanisms which Professor Friedman has talked about in his work. So I'd like to leave with the following thoughts, that when there's a potential problem, markets have incentives for people to figure out the solution. So the New York Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, PayPal, all these people profited when they solved problems to the potential prison standard. So the rules of the market emerged from the market, and I will end with this great quote from Voltaire, which just shows how, how well things work. He says, go into the exchange, the London Stock Exchange, that place more venerable than many a court, and you will see a representatives of all the nations assembled there for the profit of mankind. There the Jew, the Mohammedan, and the Christian deal with one another as if they were the same religion and reserve the name of infidel for those who go bankrupt. Thank you very much. I'm actually very poorly qualified to comment on Ed's book because the point of the book is to persuade the readers of a whole bunch of crazy ideas, and I'm already persuaded. <laughs> so I can't test whether it really does its job. Uh, the book clearly provides a bunch of interesting institutional historical information in support of views that I agree with, but most of the rest of the world for some odd reason doesn't. Uh, but what I want to do is first to discuss what I think is the most serious problem with the book, then to discuss some minor problems, and then if I have any time left, I have some additional suggestions for stuff to support what he's arguing in various ways. Uh, the main problem is that he ignores the hard problem. Uh, we like to say that your rights can be violated by force or fraud, and he's really only dealing with fraud. So that the easy problem, as he has demonstrated, many other people don't realize it's easy, is voluntary interaction. So if the question is, will you and I agree to a deal, then you can use voluntary mechanisms, and if I'm not willing to go along with those mechanisms, you don't deal with me. If the context is a voluntary association like the stock exchange, then they can make rules, as, as Ed has demonstrated they did, and people who don't agree to those rules don't get to be in that institution. But that does not solve the problem uh, where uh, on the way out of the coffee house, somebody mugs you, which happened a good deal, not necessarily about the coffee house, but but street crime was a serious problem in 18th century London, as it happens. Uh, the guy who mugged you did not have to be admitted to the coffee house, so expulsion is an effective threat. He did not get your agreement to be mugged, so the requirement to get your consent was not a, a constraint. Uh, I'm gonna be giving a talk tomorrow where I discuss one approach to those problems uh, and suggest that in a society where what ultimately uh, backs rules is the threat of the private use of force. You can then end up with something like what Ed is describing, private methods of settling disputes, but where the ultimate reason to settle a dispute is that I don't really want to have to kill you even though you violated my rights, especially because I might get killed in the process of trying to do it. Uh, it's not clear to me whether uh, Ed ought to deal with any of this in the book that the book already covers a lot of territory, he's already trying to persuade people of lots of things they don't believe, and I'm not sure that taking it one step further to things I absolutely don't believe would be useful. But I think he's got to discuss it. I think he has to say, essentially, what I'm demonstrating is that for this set of problems, private governance solves it. But governance is also used to set and solve a different set of problems. There may be ways private governance could deal with that, but that's outside my subject now. Maybe my next book will cover that. I think that would be. So that's to say my, my most serious reservation is that, that if I were a, a reader who didn't agree with the position, I would say, well, look, he's only taking the easy cases. 
We still need government and force and all the rest of that in order to prevent force, if not, if not for. Now let me run a whole bunch of details where I think the book could be improved. One of them is I think it's useful to distinguish between a hostage and a bond. That Ed uses those two terms as synonyms. The difference is that if I prepay you for something, you can punish me uh, for not carrying through the rest of my bargain. But when you punish me by seizing my prepayment, you profit. So that in trying to arrange contracts so that it's always in the interest of both parties to keep them, a bond has the disadvantage that it is a cost to one person of breaking the contract but a benefit to the other. A hostage is a bond that hurts me but doesn't help you. So if I can arrange things so that I break the rules, you can punish me but in a way that's no profit to you. That is a way of solving that problem. And I think if you think about the traditional hostage, where it's you know my eldest son, killing him doesn't get you anything, but it hurts me. And if we had more time, I'd run into I've got a wonderful English medieval story about William Marshall, one of the great figures in English history, who was a hostage uh, for his father at one point during the Stephen and Matilda mess. But in any case, I think that's a useful distinction. Second point that you don't really discuss, and it's particularly relevant to the early English case, is the issue of who chooses the court. Because the easy case is the one where the parties agree in advance on who will set it, settle it, because then they have a common interest. But in fact, in a bunch of the cases you're describing, that's not what's happening. In a bunch of the cases you're describing, we don't have a contract. I claim you have done something that owes that results in your own damages to me. And according to how the system is set up, one or the other of us may choose the court. And there is an article which I will at some point trace down, I can't give it to you now because I've forgotten who wrote it, which looks at the English courts at a point at which the plaintiff chose the court and the income of the judges depended on there being lots of cases tried with them. And he argues that when they switched the rule for paying judges to a salary, the judges became less pro-plaintiff because they had an incentive to attract cases. So it seems to me that that's an interesting issue that you really have to think about. Another one is the whole subject of the Committee of Vigilance in San Francisco, the vigilantes, because you are telling a story which might be true, but there is another story that back when I was at University of Chicago Law School, I discovered a chunk of the library shelf, which is all books about the vigilance committees. And half the books are people who think they're the good guys and half people People think they're bad guys. I don't know what the right answer is, but it's a moderately complicated story. And you also have to think about the question of whether the vigilantes were really a government. Because the vigilantes were not engaging in consensual relations with the people they hanged. All right? They were functioning much more in the way we're used to a government functioning. So one way of reading them was they were a sort of a temporary rebel government because the ordinary government wasn't doing the job. So I think you have to think about that. And more generally, of course, about the issue of what is or isn't the government. One very minor criticism, but it's one that irritated me, is that you at various points are saying this private institution has more private police than such and such a number of cities. And you had, there were a number of cases of that sort. But that's the wrong way of thinking about it, because some of those cities have you know, a population of 300. Uh, what you really want is something more like number of police per capita. And that, that it's the sort of thing which when I read it, I say this guy is trying to put something over on me because he's making an irrelevant comparison that sounds impressive. Uh, the, uh, next is just a historical mistake. The idea of the king's peace originates under the Anglo-Saxon kings, not under the Norman kings. Uh, and at least some stuff I read suggests that the, the, the privately enforced feud system of Anglo-Saxon England breaks down about a century before the Norman Conquest, although I don't know the details, but I can point you in the first two claims that I uh, Finally, I want to get to the point which Bruce may discuss in more detail of internal versus external incentives. Because it's tricky, first, because what you see as an internal incentive may merely be an internalized recognition of your own self-interest. So if you think about both the rancher case and the diamond merchant case, those are cases in which there are reputational mechanisms such that not abiding by the rules will in fact hurt you. You therefore get trained and get into the habit of it. It then feels like an internal mechanism. Uh, the 
I actually have a discussion in one of my books of what I call the economics of vice and virtue, which is essentially looking at how what we see, virtue is people who won't steal, even if they're sure nobody is looking back to Macaulay's book. The question is, why does anybody behave that way? Vice is the opposite side, the, the aggressive personality who pushes people around. And I argue along the lines of what evolutionary biologists call the hawk dove game uh, for the, the bully, that there are circumstances in which either, either which is in your self-interest <coughs> to be an honest guy, and there are circumstances in which in your self-interest to be a bully, and that you can imagine a variety of mechanisms by which people program themselves ranging from Darwinian evolution to how their parents brought them up to how they train themselves, such that once you've committed, once you've made yourself into an honest man or made yourself into a bully, now it's an internal constraint. But it's an internal constraint, it has to be an internal constraint because you need a commitment strategy. You need a way of making you go through with your threat even when it no longer pays, so people will realize you will and therefore will back down. So I think you may want to look at, to look at all of that. Uh, the another example for sort of the interesting tension between internal and external, and the one that you may want to look at, is the role of oaths in Jewish law. Because in traditional Jewish law, there are various contexts where either the plaintiff or the defendant can win a case by an oath. So that I've got weak evidence that you stole my cow, I accuse you, you can swear and be free. If you're willing to swear the appropriate kind of oath, the case is over. Where I have stronger but not absolutely conclusive evidence, it can reverse that if I'm willing to swear, I take it. I can only swear if I'm, if, if I'm a man who they trust to swear. That means if you think about constraints like the kosher rules, it means that by being willing to bear costs in order to demonstrate that I'm a good believing Jew who follows the rule, I maintain the reputation of somebody who can swear and take or swear and be free. I therefore have an incentive to do this. Again, it's a sort of a commitment maximum to be a certain kind of person. I think all of that is worth, is worth, worth thinking. I think it's also worth noting that being litigious, being willing to sue somebody, you don't only sue because you expect this case to profit you. You also sue for private deterrence. You sue this guy, so the next guy won't violate your rights. So even though it cost you $10,000, you only got $1,000 in damages, it may be worth it if the result is that the next 15 people don't try to swindle you because they know you're that kind of person. And from that standpoint, the internal characteristic of vengefulness, which we think of as irrational, can in fact be seen as a rational commitment strategy because if people know that you will move heaven and earth to avenge wrongs, they won't wrong you, or at least they may not wrong. All right, let me add a couple of other things you may want to look at. One of them is contractual practice in imperial China. Because there are sources which argue, and you're going to have to be careful because there are some problems with this, but there are at least sources that argue that you have very elaborate contractual practice with essentially no legal support. Uh, and I can point you at the relevant stuff. And the reason you have to be careful is that in the last few decades, Material low level court information has been coming out of China as a result of Mao's fall and opening up China. And some of that seems to be inconsistent with the story that was being told before, which was based on sort of the official account of how the system worked. But nonetheless, it's interesting. Something else about China you want to look at is Ronald Coase's final book about how China went capitalist, because he describes a mechanism for competing governments. That what he thinks is happening in, towards the later part of the process is you've got lots of local governments. The people who run those local governments are appointed from above, but the central government wants economic progress. So the way to get promoted is for your town or village or area to do well economically. And the result is that you've got a whole bunch of local governments that are in effect competing to attract business, to prosper, to have economic growth. And you have what are in effect uh, I guess industrial park is what we would call it or something like that, which is run by the local government and provides firms that want to start up in that park with two different offices, one of which is an ordinary landlord who takes care of electricity and internet connections and water, and one of whom is a government office that tells you what forms you have to fill out, whose permits you have to get from and so forth in order to get you through the bureaucratic maze. 
So that's an interesting case where arguably you've got a whole bunch of governments competing to develop the rules that will result in economic growth. Now, there are a number of problems with that having to do with potential corruption in the system, but I, I don't have time to go into that. Another case you want to look at in terms of unenforceable contract is the market for host mothers. Because this is, you want to have a child, your wife can't bear the child for some biological reason, so you hire a woman, uh, you will have a, your wife's fertilized egg implanted in her, or if your wife can't provide the fertilized egg, she provides the egg and you provide the sperm, but in some form you're essentially renting a womb in order to produce a child. Uh, this contract is, I think, a criminal, making this contract, I think, a criminal offense in Michigan. And I am not sure if there's any state where it's enforceable. However, it is commonly done. And apparently, from the stuff I've read, the reason it's commonly done is that the firms that arrange it have figured out how to spot which women will or won't go through with the deal. Uh, and therefore, in fact, they can get an effectively enforceable contract, even though it's up. One final historical bit that sort of fits neatly with some of what you're saying has to do with, you, you tell the story, the fairly modern story by my standards of how you get into a church court in medieval England. It look, one way of interpreting the evidence on very early Roman legal history is that the way you get a court to decide your dispute is that the two parties each swear that their side is right. False swearing is a religious offense. So now a priest arbitrates which of them is telling the truth. Each of them has to deposit a sum of money. The priest confiscates the sum of the guy who says is lying. And we have now demonstrated to the outside world which of us is right and which of us is wrong. Right. That's at least, again, I can point you with more information, but that's at least, I think, a plausible interpretation of how one of the great legal systems of the world started. All right, I think, I don't know if I'm out of time or not, but I think I've said the things I wanted to say. Thank you. It, it's uh, it's really unfair to follow David because you know he says more in a minute than I say in an hour usually. Uh, but uh, David just jumped right in and and making criticism. So I'll, I'll start out a little nicer. I'll, I'll say uh, it is a very good book. It's it's an important <laughs> one. I think it. Uh, uh, one thing I like about it a lot is is not just someone theorizing about whether these kinds of arrangements might work or not work, but he's actually looking at examples to show they do. And uh, it's, you, know, you can always argue with theory, but it's much harder to argue with uh, examples. I, I think it makes a, a valuable contribution to this literature. It, uh, it really does show us, I think, that extremely complex markets one pretty well without government interference. It probably could go a step further and say that they run worse with government interference. Um, and I think he does that in, in at least one chapter. Um, the, uh, I think, uh, I find uh, his stuff on the stock markets to be uh, really uh, interesting. Uh, I, most of them come from papers he's already, I've already read, but nonetheless, uh, that's the way we write books anymore. I was surprised initially when I started reading uh, that he was attacking some of my favorite uh, economists. Um, it, you, James Buchanan, for instance, although I, I will point out in, in the picture that he has with Buchanan and him together, he's cut in half and and that's about right. He's about <laughs> half the economist. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the reason he does that, the reason he takes on Buchanan and Hayek and some of these people, is that uh, there are people who were actually at least willing to think about private governments and talk about it and write about it. They might not uh, go all the way and accept it as uh, a good idea. But if you want to take on our usual sort of the usual suspects that we like to criticize, those guys don't even uh, think about it or talk about it. So there's not much to say uh, to those people. Um, in this context, I would say also that I really liked his chapter on Hayek. Um, it, it, uh, it really uh, was very helpful for me in thinking about Hayek. Uh, 
Uh, I wish I had written that, actually. Um, I could go on and talk about more interesting and good things about the book, but given the precedent set by David, I'm just going to jump into some criticisms now. Um, the, uh, and, and most of my criticisms uh, deal with two chapters, chapter uh, 8 and chapter 9. The 8 is, is the one he has about private uh, policing. Uh, he's heard me make this point before. Um, I, uh, he talks about the San Francisco example. Uh, uh, private patrol uh, it's been around since the 1850s. It's an interesting example. I use it myself, but it, uh, I'm not convinced that it's a good example of uh, market provision, at least, because as he points out in, in the book, uh, the, uh, uh, there's entry barriers, there's regulation that assigns these beats to one individual. Uh, they can't compete, uh, they, uh, uh, the, the beat is fixed essentially geographically, so you get a license to operate that uh, particular beat, and, and so you don't have the kind of competition that we would hope to see in a true market. Um, and, and this is sort of gets to David's point then, at, at what point do we think of this as a government operation as, as opposed to a private operation? They're contracting out with private individuals, but the government doesn't produce anything. Everything that the government produces is by some private individual on a contract. Um, so uh, it, the distinction is is not real clear. I would have liked to also, in, it, in, in addition to uh, the discussion of um, this particular example, uh, you know, at least I would have liked to see uh, some other examples, perhaps where things are more competitive. Um, I honestly can't offer one. I haven't looked for one, but uh, but I do know that private security is a huge industry around the world, uh, and it varies tremendously from place to place depending on the government regulation that's uh, in place. Uh, in some places, you do have actually private police individuals like the uh, patrol in, in San Francisco that can make arrests and all those sorts of things. In other places, government doesn't allow private security to do those sorts of things. Uh, and so uh, they are constrained, they're limited, uh, not by market forces, but by uh, government. Um, I gave a, uh, a talk to a, a group of uh, private security firm owners, an international association up in Canada uh, a couple of years ago, and I always, I kept using the, the term private police, and one of them said, why do you use that term? Uh, we're not police, we're private security. And my response was, you would, if you were allowed to be police, wouldn't you? <laughs> he said, you could do what police do. And he said, oh yeah, it's just that we can't, and we're not allowed to do that. Um, so uh, there's a huge uh, market for private security around the world. Uh, a recent study looked at 70 countries, and I think they estimated that there were somewhere between 19.5 and 22.5 million private security personnel in the world. Uh, that's, the, that's the above market kind. Uh, they couldn't estimate how many sort of black market private security that were uh, in the world, but uh, they gave a few examples. They said there's probably a million of them in Brazil, for instance. Um, so uh, there's a, a huge uh, investment in private security. Uh, it's, uh, it's constrained in part by government uh, regulations that prevent them from being uh, fully authorized or fully functional police. Uh, but uh, there's probably other examples besides the San Francisco example. I also talk about the railroad police example, uh, which is similar, uh, but uh, it, it also, I don't think, is very competitive, so it uh, doesn't get at the true market uh, test. The uh, other uh, issue I want to raise has to do, <laughs> as David suggested, with the uh, uh, idea of 
uh, internal constraints, uh, morality. Um, what uh, uh, people constrain themselves because of what they believe is right. And I, I certainly agree that we do that to a degree. Uh, but uh, I also think that like everything else in his book, um, which is about institutions and incentives and, and how people respond to those institutions and incentives, that morality is an institution uh, that uh, individuals respond to their incentives in deciding what they believe. Um, that uh, uh, philosophers have a, a definitions of what's moral, uh, but individuals don't necessarily buy those definitions. Um, today, uh, we uh, uh, see uh, people uh, with uh, very strong convictions uh, uh, taking the moral high ground when they're talking about transferring wealth, uh, taking it from somebody and giving it to somebody else. Uh, I, I recently read a, an article uh, it was, uh, titled, are we all becoming a nation of uh, George Costanzas? Uh, the, the point, of course, you all know who George Costanza is, I'm sure, uh, from Seinfeld. Uh, this article says he's probably uh, the, the most miserable complaining victim in television history. Uh, and they talk about one episode where he told his boss off and he, and, and, uh, quit his job and then he felt sorry for himself because he didn't have a job and he was talking to uh, Seinfeld about it and and Seinfeld sort of tries to feel him out to find out what he wants to do and and he says well I, I, I like sports I, I, I'd like to be a general manager or a, an announcer or something <laughs> like that and because uh, and so, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry says uh, um, well you're not really qualified for that are you he said, yeah, but that's not fair. I, sh I should be able to do it whether I'm qualified or not. Yeah, and, and this so sort of whole uh, victimized attitude that people seem to be getting uh, in our country is something that they believe, uh, I think, is uh, they have a moral view that's different than the one I think Ed is talking about in his book. And, uh, and so I, my argument is that morality itself should be thought of as endogenous, at least in the long run, that uh, we respond to the incentives we face and uh, we convince ourselves that whatever's in our self-interest is the right thing. Kant explains that, uh, of course, we all picture ourselves as, as meritorious, uh, we, uh, uh, we convince ourselves that our, we're not guilty of, of things that uh, we see other people doing. Um, essentially, he says, we, we lie to ourselves or we humbug ourselves um, to convince uh, ourselves that uh, we really are, are very moral. Um, and uh, so today, people are convinced they have, have a, an entitlement or a right to other people's wealth and things like that. Um, I don't know that that's the kind of moral con uh, constraint that uh, Ed uh, is envisioning. And uh, my point, I guess, is that constraint varies in strength uh, from institutional environment to institutional environment. Uh, I talked about Ed's book in, at George Mason and, and made most of the same points. Uh, so uh, it, he's heard it all. But, you know, a lot of us, we have to hear things three, four times before we understand it. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping, you know, with David's help, uh, we'll, we'll get through on some of these points and, and maybe in the next round, he'll uh, do a better job on some of this. <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I'm being facetious. I really did like the book. And, uh, and uh, you know, my biggest complaint is he doesn't cite me. <laughs> I do want to thank both of you so much. <laughs> Actually, it did agree with a very high percentage of the points. I could debate here and there maybe on the uh, discussion of whether morality matters at the margin.
Um, but overall, I, I tend to uh, appreciate Mr. Clinton. Uh, same, same thing with you, Dr. Friedman. The, uh, the one thing that I think is a very important point that you emphasized is there's certain things that are easy cases and then there's certain things that are more difficult cases. And when two people opt into a system, it's clearly ex ante mutually beneficial to all parties involved. People can set the rules. And I think that actually does cover a huge percentage of our interactions. So when you opt into a college, you matriculate according to the rules of the college. When you opt into a corporation, you have opted to agree to whatever their rules are. Your credit card network, your banking network, when you sign an arbitration agreement, there's an arbitration clause. So I do think this covers far more cases than most people think. And I, th I, I would be happy, I would be thrilled if everybody could just agree with me on this one point, that government is not necessary to enforce contracts, then uh, that, that's, I'll, I'll consider the thing a huge success. And then I can then get to uh, part two of the, the book, which will uh, address some of your more difficult questions. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.